Good morning, everybody. You can see me or not, but pretty brutal conditions this morning. Last night, the wind really picked up. It was like a tornado out there. It's probably 60 kilometer an hour, maybe a bit higher than that. The tent was shaking. Now it's uh, ice pellets. It might turn to rain later on today. So we won't be doing too much of anything, I don't think. Unless this clears out, but it's not expected to. Oh, I slept all right. Jeremy was up four times. Smoking the fire, having peas. We ate so much before I went to sleep. But we've been down since seven or eight o'clock. And it's about seven or eight o'clock now. So that's 12 hours of downtime. But pretty brutal. I uh, wouldn't want to be packing out today. We got a little bit of uh, water forming in the tent. Not too bad though. Our water, or uh, wood conditions are kind of low. We will have to go get some out in the rain and sleet today. Which won't be too much fun. And of course now the concern is getting out. Um, if it was like this tomorrow, I would consider an emergency stay over again because the hills to get out of here are absolutely brutal so we are kind of in you know emergency survival conditions at this point if we were to pack out today it wouldn't happen um, we're talking double the amount of time to get out 10 hours instead of 5 and in just the most brutal conditions you can think of with rain and sleet so yeah we're kind of in that we're kind of in it right now no escape really so we're gonna try to make the best of it I guess and hang out here Jeremy made a little hole by the stove with the auger just now so that we could scoop some water out as it forms because we're gonna be having hopefully a pretty decent fire today We'll see what we can get done if we can get any fishing in, or the fish are going to bite in these conditions, who knows, right? Bailing us out, got that little hole there. Yep. Here, throw it in the sled so it doesn't leak back in. Eat, poop, repeat. It seems like it's raining, but it's more like ice pellets out here. It is pretty brutal though. Might actually have to put my jacket on. These holes are all filled up. They are freezing so it must be below zero. Don't mind my camera work but it's cold guys. in this weather anyway. Look at these holes. Are you going to catch a fish in that? The line's all caught up on the edges so I'm going to have to do some maintenance. Fish can't bite like that. These are the absolute worst conditions for anything. Just on the brink of zero. I mean it would be better if it was snowing. Obviously the wind's a factor. But uh gonna get these holes cleaned up and rebaited because if I'm here I'm fishing. I gotta mess around. But, uh, we got a little bit of wood left. You see the pile behind me here. And uh I'm just looking at my clothing because if that is turning to water, I need the jacket on. I don't mean I don't mind being cold, but I don't want to get wet. So, still got our little fish up here that you can eat. working for 
forest and catch some food maybe. He's staying the same. He might be building the lake out now. Wow. There's quite a bit less water in here than there was before anyway. Oh yeah, there's definitely less water. So that one actually had no minnow on it, so could have had a bite, could have missed it. Anybody want to join us? This winter wonderland? Sleet? Ice pellets? Five hours walk from anywhere? <laughs> it's getting, getting pelted in the face. <laughs> kind of hurts. watching this and not out here. I would be happy watching this and not being out here, to be honest. At some point in time you wonder why you do it. Jeremy's big thing is you can go easy when you're 60 and when you can't do it anymore. So, there it is. When I'm 60, I can go sit in a shack somewhere, right close to town. Take a snowmobile out, snowmobile back, have a nice wood stove going with wood I cut with a chainsaw. And, uh, you know, homegrown or home store bought food and all that junk. But right now, I can actually still do it. So, do it while you can, right? Where do you wipe the fishy fingers? On the pants. Then you take your pants home and you wash them. When you're done getting messy. Oh, there was the line. I gotta get another minnow and I gotta warm my hands up. This is brutal. I right, put this fish out. I gotta go warm up my hands now. Fish slimed up. We're eating our goat. We still have a half, well, quarter of pot left. Yeah. Plus more to cook later, right? <laughs> we got a hair too. <laughs> we got too much. I don't know if you can see that without me dumping it out, but it's like slop. Good slop though. Yeah, it's tasty. You know, I stifle it for so long, and it's been a couple days, so off to the woods to poo in the sleet. all bad. The biggest problem is my legs get all wet because it's snowing on them. But uh, my wife actually talked about peeing in the woods as a girl. 
pooing in the woods as a man is pretty much the same thing. The trick is to pull your pants down, not all the way down, but to your knee. So the back of your knee, pull both your inside outerwear down to the about your knee and bunch it up in the front and back and then push it forward and then squat down and you're gonna rest on your legs obviously so knee perfectly flat and you're gonna sit right down like that after you pull your pants down so your pants are gonna be here and they're gonna be out out of the way and uh, same technique you use for you know if you're a girl I like to squat guys I find it's pretty stable um, position some people talk about putting your back up against a tree I, I find that ridiculously cumbersome to put your back up in the tree and squat it's like so much weight on your body where it doesn't need to be the squatting is a pretty natural position for people to adopt when they're doing work on the ground and also it puts your body in the, just the right anatomy for taking a dump it uh, actually I would recommend that you use a squatting technique at home too. Uh, I use a, a stool at home because of so many times doing it in the woods, it uh, puts your body in the right anatomy uh, so that you can get, you know, without being too graphic, complete evacuation. So it doesn't get bombed up. So I do it, do it at home. Grab yourself a little stool, put, up on your, put your feet up on it, bring your knees up to your uh, chest and uh, you'll find that you'll, you'll you'll be better off. You won't end up with all sorts of other problems like hemorrhoids and all those other nasty things that happen from trying having to try to push. Whereas if you put your body in the right anatomy, it just it takes care of itself. In other words, so that's how we poo in the woods, guys. Oh, line down. looking to set the hook what you want to do is you want to wait till you feel the weight of the fish because if you set it too fast the, the uh, hook will come out of its mouth so all I'm doing is lifting up if I feel enough of the weight of the fish then I'll set it but if I don't I'll leave it I want the, the hook to be fully in its mouth sometimes they'll just mouth it if they're not aggressive about it it's called goat meal Kind of like goat meal. We had it for breakfast. People eat oatmeal for breakfast, so it's called goat meal. This whole thing full was uh, starting last night at dinner. So it's a pretty good long haul, man. That was the whole front uh, shoulder of the goat. Rice and carrots with uh, wadobo spice. That's why we stew. Goes a long way. And once it boils down, you just add a little bit more water. And uh, you know, you can have nice, something nice and warm continuously throughout the day. And that's what we've been doing just to try to get our calories back up so we can make it out of here alive. This looks like a sludge, but it's a good sludge. It gives exact, your body exactly what it needs. We gotta bail out. Let's see a nice puddle in here now. We got a little small hole here that we made with the auger. And every once in a while we're having to, I don't know if this is just lake water that we're collecting in here now, or if this is from the stove, but it seemed kind of weird for it to be just from the stove. It's like a lot of water. There's been a few people have asked me, how do you tolerate the cold without wearing gloves? That was mostly in response to the bone marrow video. I was working with my hands. The answer is you just get used to it. If you're from a warm climate, the same kind of thing happens to us when we, we go there. Is we have to get used to the warm climate. And uh, of course, the, the way that happens is we start sweating. But after a while, your body gets used to it and doesn't have to sweat so much to cool. To cool. But if you're on the cold, for example, there have been some, some research and studies about Inuit people and their hands actually don't get as cold and they can tolerate going out and say like a t-shirt or something like that. 
Whereas a t-shirt to me in the Arctic would be, you know, I might last five minutes or something like that. Whereas these people could last 45 minutes. So there's something about your body that adapts to it. Probably by sending less blood to the periphery of your body, your hands, your feet. So it keeps it more in the core and that's something that you get used to over time. So it's pretty interesting the way our bodies can adapt to vast climates all over the world. Think about that, man. We're, we're, we're from the Arctic right down uh, to the equator, the hottest in the desert, all over the place. We have the ability to, to master those environments by, you know, by bringing water with us to the, the desert and by bringing heat to us uh, in the Arctic. Pretty amazing how adaptable people really are. So I'm going to go for a walk back here. And I want you guys to tell me how long you think I'll last before I step off this packed trail. We packed down with uh, snowshoes and sleds. How far off the trail do you think I'll get staying on top of the snow? You notice I can walk very easily and I'll walk behind you and then I'll take a, a hook to the left into the woods here. And uh, how long do you think, or how deep do you think the snow is and how deep do you think I'm gonna fall in? So have a watch this, all right? basically up to my crotch. And that's basically how impenetrable the forests are here without snowshoes. So you think I'm playing around, right? But the natives who lived here invented snowshoes really quickly. It disperses your weight over a bigger distance and it makes it so you don't slink down. You, you, you can't move around in those woods without snowshoes right now. Um, it's crazy. I'll show you again, watch. I'm not making this up, guys, watch. I'm gonna go more carefully this time. going to any long distance we would never get out here on uh, on just foot without snowshoes and there was a time I did an adventure like this when I was a kid in my 20s I uh, snow or I should say snowshoe back the, the conditions were perfect it was a hard pack snowmobile trail uh, conditions similar to this except it got a lot warmer at night it rained uh, all night so you know talking late in the season lots of snow we went in no problem. We walked in for probably two or three hours through this back lake uh, for brook trout, same thing. And we didn't pack any snowshoes, we didn't have any. And you know, we were young and stupid and adventurous, so we did it. Well, we got back, uh, you know, two, three hours, like I said, rained all night. We packed up immediately the next morning. We knew we were in trouble. The lake was completely full of slush. So pulling our gear back would bind up in the slush. Uh, it took us like probably an hour or two just to get across the lake to this, the trail. And then we found when we got to the trail, what happened was the top layer that was packed had uh, softened. And so every third or fourth step, we'd go all the way up to our waist again. Well, long story short is that it took us 10 hours to get out. 10 hours of slogging. I don't say this is going to be much different, but we're not going to be falling in up to our waist. The big challenge here is getting up those hills on the way out. And that's not going to be easy, but we do have snowshoes, so we're not going to be caving in. We're going to have a nice trail we can walk on, or it's not a nice trail, but that first trail we're going to have to probably do twice because we're going to have to push one sled up, come back, get the other sled. Once we get up on that ridge, we'll be okay. But that last, that ridge, that last ridge was a rough one. But uh, anyway, I just want to make sure that you guys, or at least relay the information that snowshoes are a huge trick or a huge uh, tool that you, you absolutely must have out in this environment. No question about it. So when I study a lake and I want to find out if there's brook trout in it, what I do is I look at the topography. So you can see on this side, there's a huge cliff here. And if you can imagine 
it's going to continue that cliff all the way down below here, below the surface of the water. Oh, we got a line down over here. We'll get that in a second. And the other side here, we have a similar thing where we have a nice big cliff. We can imagine, we step back and imagine this is going to be a basin where the left side here and the right side are going to meet. So we know how deep it is. And for brook trout to survive, they need that deep... <laughs> just fell in. And for brook trout to survive, we know they need that deep water because they're a cold water species. Yeah, my hand down. Uh, so we know they need deep water for the summer especially. They're fine in the winter obviously, but they do need cold temperatures to survive all summer long. So if the water's not deep, it's not cool. So anyway, if you're looking for brook trout and you're trying to find your own little gem, that's the way to do it. You find that stuff with the deep, deep steep banks and then you know you got deep water and then you know you're gonna have brook trout and there's a couple other moments but I'm not gonna talk about this today we'll get into them a little bit later but there's like spring fed water so that they can lay eggs and that they get that in the creek system here and oxygenation and pure water clean water all the things that I appreciate about nature that brook trout you know bring me into those places where they thrive is where I thrive too let's see if we can get this fish now so I can thrive even more. There's a branch in there where the fish are hanging out at. I think I might still. No. Yeah, I do. I got them. Best one so far. <laughs> Wrapped around the branches, but I saved it. Best one so far. So that's a good looking one. I'd, I'd be happy to catch those all day long. Nice size one. Look at that. Ah. No way. <laughs> no way. Holy. <laughs> that's a nice one, eh? Oh, you lucky guy. You're, th you're kidding me, man. That's a good 15. <laughs> Look at that. Beauty. Probably the nicest one we caught on this lake. Absolutely. That's, That's super. A great fish, man. I think I'm gonna have to cut the line on that guy. He swallowed it. Wild, man. Nice fish. How about that for living off the land? What do you think, man? Looks we're, good. We're doing pretty good. Yeah, I think I got my six cal six thousand calories there. <laughs> we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, that's a good look of meat pole. We're in? Yep. Okay, so uh, I contacted a company called Pelican. They're a Canadian company. They make really awesome, durable sleds. We know this because we abuse them <laughs> completely coming into this lake yeah um, and I can't see any damage at all to speak of is you, yours yeah. is in good shape too right yep yeah and mine you know we've dragged ours around this one around on other adventures as well so it stands up yeah so basically it's like I don't know a couple hundred or hundred bucks or so retail price I think so very affordable um, I had some modifications done to mine I've had tracks added. This will add a bit more durability to it. So this is a custom feature. You have to pay a little bit extra to get them. Um, and basically they screw in from the front and you got a nice runner. I did notice that uh, navigating around corners was a bit of an issue because they tracks well. But that's a benefit when you're going in a straight line. Tracking is a good thing. But uh, when you're navigating the forest, I did notice that. Uh, it's hard to go around the corners. But I also had a long rope. So... That brings me to the next thing. We both did modifications to our sled. You want to talk about yours first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so mine, I put, put a fish ruler on the inside because I found that really helpful. And I put boat cleats on. And so the boat cleats, what that allows me to do, there are three on each side, is with a piece of rope, I could just quickly wrap, 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 wrap. And then the whole load is tied in. And I, you know, because there's three on each side, I can do crosses or long crosses or whatever. Uh, I also pull mine with uh, poles 
so these have attachments so you can pull them with a sled or if you have a harness to pull them with a pole so I'm trying out a couple of different uh, retainer pins here to see which ones work the best for that yeah you can actually pull them with a snowmobile uh, they do have the poles at the front for snowmobile hookup um, what I did was similar idea except I drilled holes in the actual frame and just ran strings through it and that serves the same purpose then I can loop it around back and forth and you have the original string yeah but you don't use the original string it's the, the rope yeah sometimes sometimes yeah, yeah but the rope it comes with is I don't know to me it's probably too short um, and probably not the strongest of materials but you know grab yourself a rope it's no big deal I made slightly bigger holes to run them through burnt the ends off good to go uh, and I did get a cover with mine it does it's a custom cover that it comes with and it worked really well um, if you want to overload the sled it's not going to work if you load it probably about six inches above the top of the sled it will work just fine um, but it did it managed to keep most of the stuff in but like I say I had overloaded so things were falling out and then I would just tie it down and it worked fine so and you sometimes use a tarp over top to retain everything yeah. so you don't have to buy the custom cover but it's a nice helps. cover though yeah it is a nice cover yeah and, and I abused it and I I'm happy to report I didn't notice any tears in it so it worked really well if you were gonna pull one of these behind a snow machine I think you would want that cover oh for sure otherwise you would get uh, all that snow dust off the back of the machine would end up in your sled yeah absolutely and when it's snowing out your gear gets covered in in snow too so yeah I'm happy with this it's a really good design made by Pelican I uh, <coughs> believe you can get it in most uh, outdoor supply stores uh, you can order online as well um, but yeah it's a good heavy-duty very solid construction so I'm happy with it you're happy with yours so happy yeah and you've had yours for a couple years so I asked Jeremy how he liked his before I even talked to the company and yeah. this company was really quick in sending me something out basically within you know two or three days they had they had it in the mail for me and uh, all they asked me to do was talk about talk honestly about what I felt about it so and I'm happy to say like we ran this through everything getting here five hours of ramming into trees basically and I can't even see any scuff marks to be honest so yeah. it's done a really good job I'm happy with it well the thing is if you do any of this kind of stuff you need this you need a deep sled yeah. You can't use like your kids toboggan as effectively as you could use one of these. It's just, it's yeah, just you, not the same. You throw it in and, and nothing falls out. I'm going to keep checking these lines because the fish are not super active. And actually this one is missing a minnow. Well, because of the mild temperatures, we got persistent water issues in here. Can't say Pelican didn't bail you out, man. Nope.
gathering wood to cook on is a constant chore, man. Constant. It's very labor intensive. It's like an outdoor cooking show. Very fancy. So I've got some flour mix. Actually, it's pre-made pancake mix, more or less. A few extra ingredients added in there. My eyes wandering. I'm checking the raven coming in. I'm gonna eat all our minnows. Checking the lines. Sure they don't go down. Somebody said on the channel, kind of wish I knew who it was, but they said one day you're gonna eat pancakes. So here's the day we're gonna eat pancakes. Maybe this one's broken already. That's just the yolk. Good enough. Seems like there's a bug on me. Ah! <laughs> Who's that guy? Can't fall asleep without him. Easter egg. So all I'm gonna do is add enough eggs until it's eggy. This is so glamorous. So we don't have any milk out here for obvious reasons, so we'll just substitute egg in there and a bit of water. The duck in the tent. Uh, I should say thanks to uh, Jared, Nomadic Oasis. He gave me this canteen, which goes with the fishy thing, but I don't have the fishy thing yet, so it's a whole system. And he also uh, gave me the pot we've been using to cook the goat in. Thanks, Jared big pot so that'll go with the fishy thing when I finally get the prototype he's been working on that for a few months now it's a whole system that you can hang to cook on a tripod it's pretty ingenious so of course to go with this we have some maple syrup so I'm gonna make a batter here and we're gonna be all set to go so if this isn't glamorous cooking because I'm actually staying in a puddle of water you can go have a bath after I'm done. A bit lumpy. All good. Let's do a full, not messing around, sized cake. We just, we just uh, wash our hands off in the floor here. Well, the weather was better yesterday, put it that way. Throw some butter on there and rock it. I thought you just said you were gonna cook me a pancake <laughs> if I passed you your fork. You'll have to wait. You'll have to wait longer. <laughs> Maple syrup I made myself, as you guys all know. This is like eating dessert first. Very sanitary to lick the side, of course. Here we go. be a little bit of goat meal on the bottom here but it's all good man mmm 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 it's so good you gotta try this guys <laughs> I 
with this butter, I have, I have a visual image of me cutting it the wrong way. Yeah. Every time I cut it, right? So you got to cut it the right way. You know. Anyway, I I don't know for some reason I'm thinking about that. I don't want to cut toward me. Towards yourself, bothers you. Uh, well, yeah, it does, and it should, right? Yeah. It should be an instinct when you use a tool, like a knife, in the woods. To not cut yourself, is it? To not cut yourself. So my fingers are all seems, out of the way. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Cut away from yourself, not toward, because you probably wouldn't hurt yourself too badly. But you also could hurt yourself very badly. I think I never was paranoid about using an axe or a saw or a knife so much as after I read Morris Kaczynski's bushcraft book. Yeah. Because it's got all kinds of like really detailed illustrations for how to safely cut so that you can't miss and like hit your leg or something with your saw, right? Or Yeah. It was like all things I never really thought about. I think what makes this all good, like people don't realize why you would bother, is because the misery of being out here makes all the little miseries at home so much more culpable. And all the little comforts so much more awesome. Yeah, really. Like, oh, I could just get a fresh, clean cup to drink my tea instead of one that I had goats to in. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so part of the reason why we rough it is so your day-to-day -day misery that you go through doesn't seem so damn bad. Yeah. You'd be like, yeah, well, I spent two days living in a puddle on a lake. <laughs> on a lake called Puddle Lake. Puddle Lake. <laughs> that would have cost me $20,000 to get lifted out if I got injured. Yeah. Something to be said for testing your limits so that your day-to-day -day limits that we live in and endure seem much more sufferable. Because it can only get better than this. Yeah. In between moments of excitement, yeah. catching fish. Or if you go home, do you having think a like, good meal? Oh, my mattress is so old and lumpy. Hmm. Like, oh yeah, I was sleeping on a spruce bow bed in a puddle for two days. <laughs> in a puddle for two days. <laughs> exactly. This lumpy mattress is all right. <laughs> That's water. Jer! Jer! I'm in the water. Okay. Hold on. I'm on the bottom. Okay. Oh, I got all the time in the world then. No, you don't. My boots are full of water. Turn the camera around? <laughs> yeah. Was it already on? It's on. It's probably not in frame though. 
I'll break this stick so you have some purchase and I'll help pull you out. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were in frame the whole time, maybe. Was I? Alright, so I'm in the water. I'm gonna kick my legs up. Oh. So when you go in the water, first thing you have to do is catch your breath and make sure you're stable. Scream for help. Scream for help. I'll take one arm. Now, we got all the time in the world, but we're wet. <laughs> Okay. That's when you make the big fire. Oh. The big dry out fire. Oh. That's it. The day's done for me. That was one mistake. Yeah. That's all you got today. I was trying to put myself in frame. There I was in the drink. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's funny because when you called for me, I came out of the tent and first I checked all the lines to see where the bite was. Oh, shit. <laughs> Okay, I only see half a Chris. <laughs> Shit. Oh, it's cold. All right. Do you, uh, you want to do a big shore fire? Nope. I think I'll just do it all in there. Yeah. I don't have to panic because. I'm not immediately in danger. The shock is keeping you warm. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? The thing is, everybody worries about it, but it's actually not that cold. I mean, it's cold, but... And I hate cold water. And I would never go in the water on purpose. But it's not the end of the world. I fell in once, and the first time was just the boot. And I knew I was in trouble, I probably should have laid down, but I didn't. Oh. I, I thought, actually, the second time I went through, I thought I was past the water. Yeah. It's hard to tell where the water's edge is. So I need all this stuff dried for tomorrow. Watch this. <laughs> for anybody who's worried about going in the lake like this, you know, it's not the end of the world. Nice that you found a teachable moment in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was joking about Jared <laughs> not too long ago to jump in. Yeah, that's Prove right. It. You did just tell me to jump I in. I did. I I literally told him to do this like two seconds ago to see if he would do it for survival <laughs> demonstrations. And then look at me. The only thing I'm gullible about is carrying all the heavy stuff. <laughs> you won't jump in the river for me. Nope. You rushed. You rushed quite <laughs> you didn't rush. <laughs> Check well, the lines. Yeah, I thought that was a fish on. That was an that was an emergency call. Yeah. For Not a fish call. For future references. <laughs> so Jerry's collecting the wood I grabbed before. And I'm just putting my boots back on. Without the soles. Insoles. What? And we're gonna try our best to wring these out so they actually have a shot at drying. You can see how this would be disaster without a hot tent. These I do want 100% dry. Come on. I kinda have a shot at doing that. Come up in the tent. You notice when I went in the water, the first thing I did was brace myself. It's pretty much instinctual to put your arms out. And then you have to fight the urge to do anything because you can make your situation worse by kicking and potentially having the current drag you underneath or sinking further under the water. So I called for help and then your help should not immediately jump in and try to save you. You do what Jeremy did was cut a piece of wood throw a piece of wood out, throw a rope out, and then basically pull up on top and then use your body weight and your chest so that you don't fall back through. So that's pretty much textbook, except for the fact that I shouldn't have fallen in. 
<laughs> Alright, back in the tent to warm up and dry off. That's it. I'm not dead and I'm not going to die. So, I know I'm putting myself on the line by putting this video out, but it's a teachable, teachable moment, as Jeremy said, so why not use it, right? So, did I do something stupid? Yes. Did I make a mistake? Yes. We all make mistakes. In fact, going coming out here could have been just a mistake, plain and simple, because coming out here was a risk. I could have just stayed home. We could have went to an easier lake. We could have went to one with easier access. We took a risk by going five hours out here. Um, should I have been so close to the edge of the creek? No. Uh, why did I do it? I did it for the benefit of the video, because I wanted to walk toward the camera. That's it. Um, so I wasn't paying attention necessarily to what I was doing. I was paying more attention to the camera. So that's why I kind of went over and I actually stepped through once and then I probably could have saved myself by crawling out. But I'm, you know, in the moment you're like, oh, let's get out of here. And I was actually, second time I went through, I was pretty sure I was off. So what I've done here is uh, save myself, basically. I've uh, taken everything I have apart. I have my uh, boots taken apart, insoles out. Uh, the main boot part over here. They're open as much as I can. I'll keep manipulating them. I've used this fishy rag. I know it's kind of gross, but I've used it to wipe down everything, all the surfaces in the boot. What I want back right now is my boots. Um, I don't care so much about my snow pants, but if I don't have boots, I can't even walk around, so that's boring. So I'm trying to get those dried off, so that's why they have priority. The snow pants I've hung up from the top here, and they're sopping wet, so what I'm going to do is continue to wring them and then also use the fishy rag to dry them out. So you can see that the water is going to continue to come down with gravity. And I would do want these as exposed as possible. Once I figure the outside is pretty dry, I'll turn them inside out and then dry the inside part. And then my pants, my second change of pants, always, always have two pairs of pants. That's why, because you need something to change into if you get wet and socks. And those will just stay up overnight. I don't care about those too much. They dry by tomorrow that's fine they don't that's fine because i have my second pair um but i'll do my best to dry those jeremy's out getting some drier wood our wood hasn't been very good lately and uh so he's he went and got some some drier stuff that'll produce a uh, hotter fire uh his first thought was actually to make a shore fire which is not a bad idea because a shore fire we can get a lot hotter than this one and it would raise my core temperature but uh, to be honest, we already have a fire going, and this is the best way to dry our clothes, so... I mean, I didn't die, I'm not going to die, I'm just sitting here now, dry, and all, everything's all well. And I, I absolutely would not take that risk if I was... Uh, if I didn't have the hot tent and I didn't have that safety measure. In fact, I joked around with Jeremy beforehand to jump in purposely to demonstrate this, but I mean, we wouldn't do it because it's kind of a stupid thing to do without having a safety crew. But, uh, it is possible to do. You know, just so you know, you know, like it, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to die immediately. You do have several minutes submerged uh, to do it. And, and it, it's a long time. First thing, catch your breath, calm yourself down, pull yourself out, then get dry. Take your clothes off, get dry clothes on. Simple as that. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. Pretty wild out here. Difficult environment to master. You'd like to think that there's lots of food out here in nature, but there's not much, man. You see a couple tracks and that's it. I'm gonna come show you uh, one of the big rock faces. You can see that rock face here. Tilt you up here, look at that. Straight up. Crazy. So these lakes are formed in Canada. You can look at them, most of the lakes are north-south. So they were scoured from glaciers receding and falling back and then that would create a big depression and now those are filled with water you can see all the rock up here forming the edges of it This is 
straight up. And you know the lake goes straight down. Doesn't end here, continues to go right down. Very, very deep water here. Pretty amazing stuff. You see our tent over in the distance there. And you can see up here, if you look carefully, there's some water running down right there. It froze up. And then the inlet is over here. And then we're on the outlet. We're just a little speck, a meaningless speck in a giant natural ecosystem. We don't matter at all. If I fell in that water, I'd be like a drowned deer. I never got out. Nature wouldn't care. And this is just one small puddle. A big system. If you ever want to come and explore Canada, just get yourself a map, find a destination, try to get to it. That's what I did for a lot of my, you know, once I was able to start driving, take myself out and find these places. Amazing. That rock face behind me. It's pretty cool actually, from this perspective to look at the Look at the tent and that sheer wall. Look at that big wall up there. And that's what we came in off. The wall on the other side. Can't even get into this lake. From the left or the right. This side or this side. I'm just gonna drop the camera right here. I'm gonna walk back so you can enjoy. You can enjoy what I get to enjoy being here. And just see me going back to the tent from my perspective. Ribs are boiled and braised, so they look pretty good on that side, eh? All browned oh, yeah. up and buttery. All you did was boil them. We're gonna just pan finish them with some butter. And I put some. I uh, obviously brine them first. Boil them. Boil. Oh, yeah, them. brining. Brine them. Boil them all day. We are missing some barbecue sauce though. Brine, boiled, braise, no barbecue. No <laughs> triple B. And then the rice is going to cook in the juices from boiling wow. the goat. Rich. So it should be all right. We also added some butter. Let's have a look at that fire. Holy, it looks good actually. Yeah, so the trick was to get dry wood. We were burning wet wood for so long and making so much smoke. I'll damp it down, let even keep a little more heat in there. Damp this down too. We're getting so much smoke, now we got a nice hot fire. We went after really particularly dead wood. And see this stuff here was standing in the swamp. Makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. So lesson learned. We'll mess around with the wet stuff. Get that dry standing, super dry standing stuff in the swamp. It's exposed to the elements. Jiggle those ribs. Jiggle those ribs. That looks really good actually. I think they're gonna be. I've never had my own homemade ribs, so butchered that animal myself. Watched it die. Uh, alright. Stuff we wanted to cover here. So Look at this list. Look at how small this and how long this list is. Long list. These are all your concerns and questions. 
I read them all. And then I use it as launching points for videos and discussions. So one of the one one of the questions was <clears throat> how long before you know meat spoiled? So okay, the question is usually is in reference to uh, like roadkill. Oh, how do you know roadkill's bad? By the smell. By the look. It's kind of an experience thing. Yeah, and it's nuanced, right? Because you wouldn't pick up roadkill in August, would you? Yeah, I have. <laughs> Did you eat it? Yeah. I picked up a moose on a 30 degree day in July. Okay, but you knew it You knew it just got hit. Yeah, like 14 hours ago. That's not so bad, but it's a big a moose, a big animal. So it's like, it's I couldn't believe fast. I touched the top of the animal and it was so hot sitting in the sun. Well, of course it was. like, there's no way. Like, it almost you couldn't leave your hand on it from that dark hair sitting on the side of the road. Well, that would make it spoil faster. And, it was uh, probably bolted up like a balloon. All I did is I carved a hind quarter off. So you also could just avoid all the gross parts. Anywhere yeah. it's been hit, anywhere that there is gut cavity, yeah. you could just start working it at the back. So what I'm famous for is having a knife in a bag in my car. And if I find a roadkill deer, you do a line along the spine, you peel it back, you do two cuts, you take out a tender or a back loin, two more cuts, take out another back loin, and they'll just don't even worry about the rest. Yeah. Yeah, you're taking out the choice cuts. Yeah. I've done that before too. Yeah. You don't want to gut an animal if you don't need to. So that's one way to avoid it. You just take out the back hind quarters. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that. So basically it's nuanced. Like you wouldn't, if you knew when the animal was killed, it was 14 hours for a moose, you take the hind quarters out, you're probably fine. If you want to salvage the tenderloins, you're probably going to be in rough shape. You're probably going to pull the tenderloins out of the middle and they're going to fall apart because they're going to get so hot. They're going to basically have cooked inside the animal. Yeah. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to pick something up that was August, say <clears throat> really warm weather that had been um, badly bruised and banged up right that wouldn't be good no so you got to use your judgment and like jeremy said smell is a big factor if it smells bad leave it yeah um if it tastes bad <laughs> leave it if you cook it and it smells worse rather than better yeah. it's not good no the meat should smell like nothing when you cook it it shouldn't smell it shouldn't smell bad yeah, don't take chances if you're not sure just don't eat it exactly or feed it to your kids and see what happens yeah we kept a, a, a grouse we picked off the road in was september right but the nights yeah. are cool yeah. Right, and it's a small animal, so it's just not going to get really warm. And it's you know in northern Ontario, so the nights in, in the fall are cold. Yeah. So do we ever worry about forest fires, like when we're you know making bushfires and stuff like that? Yeah, I worry about starting one. Yeah, I don't ever worry about being caught in one. No, I know. I think that that's what they mean. Like, should you worry about making fires in the woods? Yeah, we should always be really careful. Is it likely be to res be res responsible with your fires? Is it likely to happen? What do you have to do to get rid of to make sure that you don't cause one? Well, if you camp in uh, established camp areas, they usually have safe pits or on canoe routes. People have built really good stone ones on top of bedrock. So, you know, one of the worries in our area is that if your fire goes underground, there could be dry material underground and it can burn underground and then come back up and then start burning above ground right yeah they burn they can burn it in the root system and then find a way to surface so you always put water on your fire when you're done and uh yeah does it well if you want you can scrape your scrape your coals out so the next person gets a clean fire pit and can see that there's bedrock underneath or you know what's there all right we actually had a good conversation about this one <clears throat> the other night Jeremy and I kind of threw it out at the end of the conversation and I thought it would be good for maybe Jeremy to answer this one. Oh. <laughs> well, you, you had a good answer. Yeah, you, you can eat. It's a long question. Re Zin wrote, the last few minutes of your video were really interesting and true. Now I know why I like survival stuff. It first began with interest in a few survival games and I liked it when the games was pretty much developed about lots of detail for hunting. I like to go hunt for real, really but I don't know where to start, where I live. As you were talking about what men are supposed to do and what, what men, women are supposed to do, I found myself struggling as I am female, but I want to do stuff that males usually do. And as a woman, you have to double proof yourself and sometimes you just get underestimated a lot and so on. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So basically she's saying that she wants to go and hunt like the boys, 
but she's worried or she guess she realizes that she'll be she'll have to do double the amount of effort that the men will have to do for the same amount of respect is what I take it so you had a good answer to it and I, and I pretty much agree with what Jeremy said so I probably have two answers now I'm thinking it over but I think when guys are out they're teasing each other all the time because they want to get a, a measure of each other and so if you're out with the guys they may also tease you in a guy way and uh but you might see that as more like demanding to do more than is actually expected of you. And also like we come out here and do all the wood chopping and all the cooking and all the cleaning and all the, we do everything, right? So it can be done. Yeah, so guy, when men go out, they like we give, we give each other a hard time. We don't piss each other off. But we don't go easy on each other because if we do, then you might think that you can just get away with doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then you're just a little camp princess. So if you want to hang out with a man, you can't be the camp princess, but also you don't have to go and overexert yourself because men right away almost establish some kind of hierarchy. And, you know, there's people who know more about the given situation than other men. And then there's younger people around camp, boys, and they're learning. So the older men basically put them to the ranks and give them a little bit of grief in order to inspire them to get stronger, but also make sure that they know that they're lower than them in the hierarchy. So it'd be kind of foolish if you were a girl pretending to be on equal footing to the men to begin with. Not saying that you're not capable of doing it, but generally speaking, men are pretty interested in doing bush stuff to begin with. They have lots of experience doing it and that excessive amount of experience means that they're going to be dominant in this situation and you probably should let them. You know, especially given that you learning survival based stuff from a video game, chances are you probably don't have any or very little real world experience. So you should just basically let the guys kind of be dominant. I mean, that's what they're there for. And then and then if they're smart and they're good people, they're not going to make you feel bad because you're not as capable as everybody else but like jeremy said they're going to rib you yeah if you're if you're out there you know it's a sign of respect if you get ribbed exactly right. it is really yeah i mean that's a good way to put it for the boys out there if you if you have a mentor and he's ripping you he's he, he, he actually legitimately cares about you if he's being mean he doesn't yeah. right if he's belittling you if he's teasing you he's he's trying to test your metal yeah you know he's trying to see what you're what you're made out of and he's trying to see if you're you're going to be there by his side if there's a crisis, right? But if you walk away after he teases you, I mean, what are you made out of, right? So if you're just gonna if you're just gonna bail because you got teased, you probably aren't very strong to begin with. Yeah. So you just have to hang out with guys who aren't going to be mean. Yeah, but fine. Gonna respect you. Respect you and uh, teach you, and then uh, if you become capable enough, and they still don't respect you, I mean you know maybe it's part of your demeanor you know part of it's because you're going to be a girl but there's lots of women that are perfectly capable and you wouldn't rib them as much yeah you would hey you would rib them as much tease people tease people but not yeah i don't know like if you bring a girl you, i don't know <coughs> you know put her through the same amount of paces that's what i'm getting at or maybe you do i don't know you don't know probably tease a little bit but yeah but you understand their capabilities are different. Their level of expertise is different, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say their capabilities are different, right? Because uh, capabilities like potential. Experience, but, yeah. yeah. Well, put it this way. We play hockey with girls. And they're not as physically strong as the guys, right? And there are some guys who are not as physically strong as the girls. <laughs> but um, being a stronger hockey player, I don't, I don't compete as aggressively with them. Right, I don't go in full tilt just to show them that they're, you know, that I'm better than them. Even though I would, well, no, I won't say that because some of the weaker hockey male players, I don't go hard on either, and I give them some space so that they can actually, you know, stick handle the puck for a little bit before I'm completely knocking them over, right? Because <laughs> that's no fun for anybody. So if you're with the kind of people that knock you over, but you should be prepared, boys too 
to be ribbed in in male company. I think it's a sign of uh, low self confidence that if it, and, and maybe not being around men too that you uh, you see that as a negative rather than what it is, and that's a positive. Somebody who's trying to actually make you a little bit stronger in the long run. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, just that being outdoors is not just a manly pursuit. No. Because everybody lived outdoors at one time, right? Everybody hunted and gathered in different capacities, so. And it's not a competition either. No. No. It's lot, cooperative. Yeah, a lot of the stuff we do is cooperative, even though we might rib each other, you know, if somebody gets a bigger fish. Or somebody else is, you know, taking it easy. But yeah, look, today where I caught, like, the biggest fish by far. <laughs> But you also fished me four to one. Off my tip up. <laughs> Jeremy's tip up only caught one fish. It was a good one though. <laughs> it was worth three of those small ones. <laughs> Is that so? Yeah. So see, it doesn't really matter. Turn the camera off so I can punch you out. <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna get out of here alive. <laughs> yeah, nice. Me too. <laughs> My hands faster. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were just making threatening noises at me. <laughs> Look, Sal's watch. <laughs> we'll pound on trees. You can yeah. know how, how strong they are and how ferocious they are. Apparently, Sasquatches make all sorts of weird sounds, eh? Well, they do it because they like the taste of flesh that's got a little bit of fear in it. Apparently, they knock on trees. So we aren't planning to have a super big fire overnight, but we're gonna get some wood together, pile it in. Uh, it's not supposed to be super cold tonight either, so that's the reason why. But we get some couple, couple logs put together. Maybe we'll start the fire in the morning, maybe we won't. Uh, but tomorrow's pack out day, so we do want to try to dry off my snow pants and my boots. It would be great, and uh, otherwise have a nice warm night. So a little bit of wood in, in the tent, organize. The inside part here, it's getting pretty wet in there, which is not super fun either. But we're gonna do that's the we we had to decide if we wanted to set up in the woods and uh, only fish sparingly or park it right on here and deal with the water, but fish all the time. So we've been able to fish basically for two days straight since we got here. So that was the trade off. We had to deal with the slush in the water in the tent. But so be it, right? interesting questions or comments I should say they're not questions they're kind of questions comments so I'm gonna have Jeremy read these because I think they're kind of interesting sure Skoski 79 one question was purple the only color left when you went to store to buy those clothes I mean a bearded manly man like yourself in purple he he makes me chuckle to myself every time I don't mean to be an ass just think it's a funny color choice haha <laughs> And Callan Vasily commented, you're rich now, smiley face. You can afford buying some new pants. Those 1990 ski pants are getting old, don't you think? You covering up the purple? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's actually a long story behind this. Well, it's not a long story. <laughs> I don't like the color of these pants either. My dad gave them to me. Um, he used to wear them, so they're his actual snow pants, but he doesn't go outside anymore. And for a long time, I was wondering what I could do with the purple color, because as you guys know, purple is not a very manly color, and it's kind of weird. But I'm also not very fashion conscious, as you know, because mostly I just wear camel pants over and over and over again. <laughs> so I'm no, uh, I'm no fancy bushcrafter for by any means. 
So I was wondering how I could do it and I thought, well, let's just see how long people will tolerate my purple pants <laughs> before they'll start to make comments. And actually, I think those are the only two comments I could dig up where people complained or commented. Not complained, but <laughs> commented about my purple pants. You did two years of videos? Yeah, well, winter stuff too, right? Yeah. So, I see you guys, maybe you're not very fashion conscious either. And you tolerated my purple pants. And jacket. So, one strip down, <laughs> I might have to go over again because it's a little wet. Naturally. You need more of those broader Sharpies. So, maybe I'll do one side. And then the people who didn't watch the full video <clears throat> won't wonder why I lost a strip of purple. <laughs> I don't think one marker is going to do it, actually. No? no. And the reason why I just didn't get a whole new suit, that, that brings up the reason, <laughs> is because this suit deserved no disrespect. <laughs> it is ridiculously warm. To the, It's so warm that I don't even need to wear the jacket. So the pants are phenomenal. Get a couple more Sharpies, and by the next time you see me wearing mm. these, you'll know why they disappeared. And you might even think I got a new pair of pants. It's almost bedtime. Tomorrow we pack out, packing out probably won't be a separate video, so I'm probably just gonna include this on the end of it because you actually should watch us pack out, especially if you wanna win the Easter egg hunt. If you haven't been paying attention yet, there's already been some through. <laughs> um, but a uh, bit of a spoiler, there's one to go. So you have to watch us pack out if you wanna win. I carried this marker in five hours so I could do this bit. Did you carry it in or did I carry it in? <laughs> I don't know. Guys, I might have carried that marker in for five hours. Nobody can see you, you're off camera. For this video segment. That's my other person talking. Could be here. Uh, you actually Still in the frame. Still in the frame. I'm just horizontal. We're camping in a puddle. Yeah. I don't really recommend it. Hopefully this is the last time I camp in a puddle. All right, guys, good morning. Uh, last night was pretty rough, it was pretty windy, but thankfully everything held up. Uh, we found very early in the evening that that wind was so strong coming off the lake that it was blowing all the smoke from the chimney down back into the tent. So uh, not a good situation. So we kind of last minute, we rigged the chimney so it went straight up instead of coming out. Um, probably not the right way to do it, but it was the only way we could manage without having to spin the tent all around. and rejigging the whole deal uh, or actually just not going without the stove at all which wasn't really an option this guy's kind of cold last night uh, another issue we have this morning is we are kind of stuck in the, the bottom skirt that holds the tent down it's full of ice now and uh, so we're, we may have to boil quite a bit of water or something or other just to get out the tent out which is going to be quite a bit of work extra I'll show you what we're looking at as far as our tent situation, pretty much hobo style. Jared just getting ready and uh, we're in a big puddle all over the place, all around. And our gear, we're just trying to sort through, get back into bags. You can see, pretty messy overall. So we may set some lines this morning while we're trying to get everything done. We'll definitely boil up some water and work away at freeing the tent. Um, Jer said it was pretty clear last night and the wind finally died down by this morning so that'd be the first time we might see some sun today actually on our way out yeah that'd be all right uh, any thoughts uh, yeah I'm, I'm glad that we <laughs> re-rigged the stove last night because it was nice to keep it going it kept us pretty warm right and, and it didn't get just a little bit smoky it got really smoky oh yeah it got unlivably smoky in here yeah all uh, the way like top to bottom smoke it wasn't just a puff it was like yeah yeah full uh, house fire smoke yeah well and in the end we i like what we did with the skids too to get the stove raised right up and i'm glad that it fit with a straight chimney because i wasn't really convinced that it would but it seems to be all right so so yeah. far so good you can see here the the chimney goes straight up now instead of out and we 
didn't burn the back of the tent by the looks of things, so that's good. And then here's the those skids. So the skids basically front front all the way to the back. Back there, and then the legs sit on top, and then the ref fire reflector underneath. So we may be doing that next time as a system. So we did learn quite a bit uh, on our first hot tent adventure, trial and error style. Yeah. <laughs> the hard way, but that's the only way you learn, unless you have an expert with you, and then you take full advantage of that expert to tell you exactly what to do. But we didn't have one, so we did what we did. We got it done. It's always fun the unpacking bit. I mean the repacking and then the going home and the unpacking. It's all part of the jar all part of the journey though, and you have to get used to that part. It's not the fun part, but if you take your time you can enjoy doing it too, right? If you're in a hurry to get out of here, you gotta wonder why you came to begin with, right? A lot of people are pretty rushed to get out and they cut their last day short and they wanna just go home and get the comforts, which is kind of a natural feeling. But you have to take your time and enjoy the whole process. Here's my pee. It's my pee jug. So what I do is keep that in the tent with me, and then when I need to pee, I can pretty much do it laying down in the tent. You might not think that's a small thing, but when you're winter camping, being able to lay down, having a midnight pee without going outside, means you can get a better night's sleep. So, pee jug, guys. None of our lines were set overnight. about a quarter inch, quarter inch of ice in the holes, not too bad. See we'll have a pure sunny day. You might look forward to sunny days but the overcast days are the, the warmer days. Something about having that shield over top that protects all your heat from escaping. So, it will be a little chillier, a little breezier, but it'll be a lot warmer in that sun when it finally gets over. It'll be nice and warm. I'll show you my our, uh, chimney set up here. You can see that over my shoulder. We, uh, I was concerned the wind would blow it over, so we used it rigging system we had for running horizontally. Anybody hot tent experts out there watching this let us know if we did okay. We used a, I used some snare wire here connected to the stove pipe and then we anchored it to our cross that we had before so that's anchored into the snow because the wind you can see the wind is blowing that way so as a horizontal pipe the wind was basically shooting straight back into the tent here on the horizontal so maybe we had to turn the tent but that wasn't in the cards last night uh, future references yeah anybody who, who has any information about how this stove pipe should be oriented if it absolutely must be flowing the opposite way to the wind um, I would accept that but if there's another way like maybe a 45 or maybe a stepper steeper pitch because we can only get so much with the 45 coming out of the stove but it was a real problem like that that smoke was unbearable there was no way we were getting out of that you know we would have to let the stove die down so here's the main concern that I have is that skirt lining is all in ice now
Okay, so that's one big worry done. <clears throat> we really should have the fishing line set to make maximum use of our time, right Jeremy? We should what? Have the line set. Yeah, Jer Jeremy doesn't want a li line set, he wants to hightail it out of here, but I told him we have to take our time. So maybe we should go do that next. Is that the lines? A couple lines. Now that we're already packed up? Yeah, we're pretty much good. Like, all the uncertainties are out, so now it's just kind of... Yeah. Well, we can set some lines <coughs> and... Uh, eat breakfast? Have a little bite to eat. Yeah, okay. Drink lots of water. So yeah. Dry these out. Alright, let's go do that then. You already had a bite and got stripped. <clears throat> oh, we got a bite here. This last line's been our most productive one. We already got a bite on it. Let's see if we can get a fish for the road. Missed them. Shoot. He'll be back. Jeremy just, uh, did you catch it? Couple perch. Perch. Well, we're getting some bites anyway. Give you a, a look at the tent, what it looks like without anything in it. To give you a better perspective of what we've been dealing with, you can see the spruce boughs are absolute 100% necessity. You see, there's probably about an inch of water. You see, where just where we put those heated water bottles, they sunk right in. You see that. Uh, Wow, Jer, come look at this uh, stove. It's it's hovering. <laughs> it's yeah. literally hovering. I know. On those, that's not very safe. That's why I wanted those skids there, because it was getting impossible to wedge it, right? Yeah. So I mean, lesson is, I think two days on the ice is not good. No, it's too long. One night, and then you, you I mean, you could do it. You just have to move. Yeah. You'd have to move once. Yeah. And the, the spruce bars are saying they're absolutely in the necessi necessity, right? You can see how we stay dry, but only because of the spruce bars. If we if we doubled the amount of spruce bars in here, that would insulate the ice a little bit from the heat of the tent, right? A little bit. So you'd get a little bit less melting. And if we had our stove propped up right off the get-go, a little bit higher, that might have made a difference. Yeah. I don't we, know. But we, that rained, right? Yeah, and it rained. And it was hot and... So we, we, we definitely learned some things this trip. One night might be the max. So like I said, we'd probably do one night on the ice like this, or if it was really cold. Um, if you're ice fishing, I mean, it's the way to go because we could, we could fish basically constantly for two days, which you can't do if you're up on shore. So I think these are the kinds of things you can only learn by doing them. It's nice and warm in there though. <laughs> yeah, you can watch other people on YouTube do them too. So. Well, I've watched hot tent videos before, but and we talked to a few people about what they thought. But until you go out and do it, you don't really know. 
you know I don't know how you want to do it maybe maybe you have a better way and uh, let us know about that chimney it's pretty good now coming straight up not back no backdraft anymore nice to catch one more fish Let's see if we can make that happen like one of the funny things is that Jerry's taking all our cut wood and he's putting it in the bush. He's stacking it in the woods for uh I guess he's coming back. But that's not even <laughs> that's not even where we would camp. We would camp at our other spot up here. So we'd have to paddle all the way down here to get that cut wood. So in other words, there's no chance that that wood's ever gonna get used, but I don't think Jerry wants to waste the wood. He wants to make most use of it, even though it's dead, it's not technically being wasted. It's kind of a, a little bit about Jeremy's character. Storing wood in the woods. <laughs> you ever gonna use that wood? Hey? You ever gonna use that wood? Maybe in the spring. <laughs> Could get some new wood. I'm making fun of you. What's that? I'm making fun of you for storing what? wood in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> wow, well, I don't want to leave it on the ice. Uh, it'll end up on the All shore. Hey? It'll end up on the shore. Maybe. Of course it would like three miles down the creek. Well, that's okay too. Structure for a fish. It's not gonna do anybody any good. You know what, it's such a good feeling to go back to a campsite where you've been. And but you're, find we're not you... gonna go back to that campsite though, well, are we? Well, we might go to that one, but like- You're gonna, pa you're gonna paddle? <laughs> that's less work than chopping all the wood. I don't know about that one. And it's like the feeling. The feeling. The feeling of like, See? man, look at all this wood I left for the next trip, I'm awesome. I think that's more a character thing than a, than a what you, efficiency thing. <laughs> Like, yeah, for sure it is. I love to go back to a campsite where even there's like firewood that you haven't cut yet, so it's still in a big long pole, you prop it up in the trees, it stays nice and dry, and you come back like a year or two later, and like, man, all this dry firewood waiting for me. So it's memories based. Partly. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no way that's like, it, there's no way you need to move it off the lake. It'll end up in the river, it'll form structure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's trees all over the place people downstream will be like whoa, whoa somebody was camping up from here it must be worth busting a trail in. yeah <laughs> so maybe that's, that's really, why i'm just getting rid of the evidence you're hiding your tracks <laughs> well, we're going to try to eat 3,000 calories right now before we leave so we net out all right i don't think it's going to happen but we'll give it a go it will be too cold to walk. So that's it for this trip. I'm gonna pack up. I want to film a little bit coming out. I want to show you the hills. Jeremy will have a vlog on this. More vlog style, right? You, sure. talk, you talked about how you went in uh, in the fall to rediscover the lake for a different route. Yeah. Basically to come in this way. So yep. if you're interested to see how Jeremy found out how to get here, I would watch that. Basically came out on the top of that rock. And the funny thing is he called me. <laughs> That's right. On his cell phone. Guess where I am? I'm like, well, <laughs> outside my house, maybe? <laughs> I'm on the shores of Puddle Lake. <laughs> no way. I said it exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Using that voice. Yeah. Check that out. That's a brookie eating a brookie. <laughs> eating a minnow. Wild. Look at that, it's got his jaws. The only reason I caught it is because it didn't let go of the brookie. Wild. So now you know when you look at those big fish, this isn't a big fish, this couldn't even swallow that one, but this one was probably struggling on the hook for so long they said it was a forget and I'm gonna try to eat that. There's no way that thing could swallow it. You wouldn't think so. That's crazy. Check that out, man, that's wild. That's a good finish to the uh Look at that. That's amazing. It's gonna fall off soon here. Oh, there it goes. There he goes. But that's a good, that's a good brookie here. Yeah. Jeffrey. Jeez. That's a good size one. For here. That's a good size one for here. Good way to finish it off. You can see that square tail. That's how you know it's a brook trout. Uh, lake trouts have fork tails. And look at the natural colors on it. If you could tell, it's got blue, blue halos, red spots. Beauty. All right, 
Glad I didn't get skunked on the last day, and that's a good way to finish it off. A brookie eating a brookie. Such is life, right? A whole cycle, top to the bottom. Something eats something else. Now that we're done fishing, we're gonna get rid of our minnows, and a lot of people would throw them down the hole, but uh, you really risk introducing a new species to a lake if you do that. So if you're fishing with minnows, usually they get eaten or they die, or very few of them get off the hook and survive. Uh, but we wouldn't want to just dump a couple of dozen of them in there because a lot of trout lakes are Just catching garbage <clears throat> They have very low diversity so brook trout might be one of only three or four species in a lake and they don't do as well when you start introducing other species so these guys just go out and I saw crows flying around yesterday as soon as we're gone, a crow's gonna come by, land here, and start snooping everything, and eat those up. And how long are those gonna take to die if we just leave them? Oh, 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Not very long. You could foot stomp them if you want. Yeah. Somebody's gonna say something about how humane it is, but... Well, we're already hooking them and using them as bait, so, <laughs> you know, it's kind of the same fate. Die by getting eaten by a big fish, or die by, I don't know, being on the ice for 30 seconds. Life is full of pain. If, you, if, if it wasn't painful to die, you wouldn't try to avoid it. That's right. So as an addendum to that, um, this system has perch in it. Uh, and that, the, the perch probably got in the system the exact same way. Somebody was fishing with a bag of minnows. There happened to be a few perch minnows in there. The perch minnows escaped and they ended up in the system forever. So now we have perch in here, which is a native brook trout lake. You know, people might think it's a good thing. You don't want to kill the fish, just let them go. Well, you can, you can do that, but you'll upset the natural ecosystem that's already there. And, you know, I'm not going to value judge that or ethics judge that, but I do prefer fishing for uh, brook trout over perch, so I'm not going to exacerbate that problem. So this is the creek system we came in, came in on on the summer trip. We followed the creek down in the canoe. The banks are too steep to get over. And the other way. Well, it's not so bad. I think Jerry's gonna go up the hill by himself. Billy goat. I'm not making it up there by myself. No? No. Not gonna happen. Alright. Do you wanna come back? You wanna help push? Yeah, I'll go right? first and we'll come back. Yeah, I'm pretty low energy. Yeah. How about you? I'm not bad actually. Oh, Better can, than when we started. You can pull my sled. Maybe I got your sickness. <laughs> Maybe. 
All right, so that's the hill we're going up. I'm not going to film because I'm going to run out of film going all the way up. I mean, I had to come all the way back too, so there we go. Okay, so we still have about a kilometer left, but we're on the main feeder, I guess you could call the feeder trail, where we take off from. So most of the hard journey's done. Uh, I wanted to talk about the pelican sled and uh, do a little bit of a recap on the whole adventure. So uh, hang tight, I'll overlay some images of us walking out, um, just as a testament to how durable the pelicans are. As you see, the front took a lot of beating in it doesn't show it though. <laughs> These are like one little, two little fingernail scratches on the front. Yeah. That's it. And then even where I drilled and tied in, there's nowhere, none. Like yeah. you could not even tell we it's amazing. completely abused these sleds. I, I'm sure I hit a hundred trees coming out and like there's hardly any marks on mine either. Just a little bit on the nose. Yeah. And, and, and you couldn't, like you, you would never be able to complain about the mark like that. So these things are tough as nails, man. Yeah, we're driving over trees bigger than your thumb, right? Yeah, and like smashing and everything. <laughs> I was riding down on the back of my sled a few times, just put my weight on it and just ride down because it's the only way you can really control it in the conditions. Yeah, yeah. I have no brakes on mine, uh, having the rope in the front. Uh, one thing I did notice, I was, uh, as far as tracking goes, uh, probably good to have mm. the tracks on a straight line run, but if you're gonna go around corners and bends, uh, maybe not so much, but you know what? There's like 1% of people who are actually going to do this type of thing with yeah. this type of sled. Well, and I was thinking too, if our snowshoe, we weren't sinking in the snow, right? So if we sunk a little deeper, it would follow along on our path, but it basically was floating on the surface. It could go anywhere it wants. So yeah. the tracks just took it yeah, straight so, lines. So this, so the tracking system is good straight line tracks. I would recommend it. Uh, obviously durability wise, it's going to be a lot better. Uh, Jeremy does not have the tracks on his, so his tends to pivot a little easier. Yeah. So if, <laughs> if you're doing re really ridiculous things like us, cutting corners like that, maybe go without the tracks. But yeah. if you're going in, you know, 90% of what everybody else is doing with their pelican sled is going in a straight line anyway. Not like every every couple feet turning. Yeah. Uh, some things I learned about the trip was, uh, I think we talked about a little bit before, but Camping on a lake in a hot tent, I probably would not necessarily do uh, for two nights. Uh, and the, the chimney, we lo used a lot, uh, learned a lot about the chimney, how to set up, and probably would not do that on an open water. No. Have it facing maybe at least with the wind uh, so that we didn't get too much smoke blown back in. So that was a little bit of a learning curve there. Yep. Um, no major mishaps uh, to speak of. We fell the lake. <laughs> I completely forgot. <laughs> to me, to me, it wasn't a mishap because oh, no. it was like uh, something I had experienced with before. So it was like you know, standard everyday thing. Pants are dry, 100% dry. They're not purple anymore. Yeah. Uh, so and it yeah. did ruin our trip, right? Like we worked no. around it and no. he turned it into a teachable moment. And yeah, it, it really didn't. It didn't. It didn't bother me once I knew I, you know, I was okay. It's stable. I was fine. And uh, I didn't even think that it, it, dug, it was going to ruin my trip at all. At that point, I, it, you know, I could use the brake anyway, so it just went in the tent. Yeah. And if we didn't have a hot tent, we would have made a bushfire, a big one. Yeah. Right? And yeah, that's, yeah. that's why it's important to have two people. This is not a solo adventure. No. You could definitely not do this by yourself. And, yeah, and don't go with somebody that you don't think you could drag out if they got hurt. Well, not only that, but uh, <clears throat> don't go with somebody who isn't on the same page as you. Uh, as far as cooperation and somebody who's not gonna who's who is going to be in it for themselves the entire time and just kind of leave you stranded There's a lot of times where we had to do one sled only Pushing yeah. up the hill. Yeah, we teamed those sleds a couple times to get them up the hills because it was not like you would not make it No, and if you have a guy who says I'm gonna go light and then you got all the gear That's essential <laughs> and he's leaving you down carrying all the stuff He's like well, I packed light and you know, you should have listened to me You know like we got we brought extra gear back 
already. We brought extra food because yeah. I wanted to have extra food security. We brought the snowshoe here all the way in and all the way back because <laughs> we weren't going to waste it. We brought fish back because we just had too much food. Yeah. And those were decisions we had mutually agreed on. Like, the, you know, you wanted the goat shoulder and the goat ribs where we didn't have to bring that. Yeah. Um, and but but food was to me something that I I would feel I felt more comfortable bringing. So Jeremy ended up bringing it in, and then we did some trade-offs as far as like cheating with a snowmobile coming part way in, where we decided not to. So yeah, um, and that's something that Jeremy insisted on that I would have you know happily used the snow, snowmobile part way, at least just for a little bit of an assist, like a third of the way kind of thing. But you wanted to be authentic, so we did it all on foot. Yeah, you know, it was uh, awesome. It was awesome. It was a yeah, lot of work. So we catch a bunch of small fish, uh, one good fish. Well, it was uh, measured out at what, 14? 14 inches? 14 did a bit. Yeah, so 14 inches is a pretty good brook trout. Yeah, 36 centimeters if you're Canadian. Not trophy status. Trophy status is a three pound. But it's my trophy. It's Jeremy's biggest brookie. Yep. So that, and, that, and that's not a bad fish. I'd be happy with a fish like that. So yep. We, uh, we didn't catch our weight in uh, brook trout, but, um, you know, we were always on the lookout for the next adventure. So we're talking about some things going up north and doing some, some more, uh, maybe not as challenging, but maybe more productive. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, brook trout fishing around here is not the greatest. You got to work for it. You have to work for it. And there isn't even many avenues where you can work for it. You know where the opportunity is yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. There's, even if you worked for it, you could find it, but there's not too many of those left. So, um, snowshoes worked well, both of us. Yeah, Actually, my strap broke. You just yeah, but Mine's going been tied right on away. The whole way, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, and then we had uh, fallout plans. People knew where we were. Uh, I think I let yeah. my wife know where we were. So yeah. worst case scenario, but like I said, we had left enough food and to last at least another week and yeah and we've done four weeks without eating very much food at all so no biggie there it's it's been like close to zero the whole time right a little bit above a little bit below yeah colder last night i wore my summer pants for the whole hike in and the whole hike out and yeah. i haven't gotten cold no because we're working that hard yeah and i'm sweaty but i don't care people say you sweat and you die it's it's kind of a it's not really necessarily true um i sweat and i'm fine so Wrap it up or we good to go? That's a wrap. Do you want us, anything else we didn't cover? Pretty big, pretty much everything? That's everything. Yeah, the hot tent worked well. Yep. Uh, first time trying it, so. I mean, they're pretty much foolproof anyway, as long as they're kind of know what you're as doing. As long as you don't get smoked out. I would use twice as many boughs next time if we had the time and enough boughs nearby. Sure, yeah. That would make a big difference. Yeah, it would have. It would have combated a lot of the slush that had built up in the water. The water yeah. was just inevitable once we got that pit. And there's lots of times where lakes are just filled with slush anyway, and it, you probably wouldn't want to set up on the lake. But this one here, we did have a place to, to camp, but not every lake like this has a place on the edge of the, the lake to camp. Yeah. Right? And then we have to divide your time between fishing and camping. And it's nice to do both at the same time, which is probably why we got so many fish. Yeah. We, we would have got half as many at least if we were trying to split up cutting wood and, you know, camp chores and so forth while trying to go out and fish so yeah so it was a good trip uh jeremy wants to go back i don't <laughs> yeah back to puddle lake yeah yeah well we'll see i'll go back that or or some or somewhere else i think if i find somewhere else jeremy will go yeah we've been scouting up further north so i think that may be the time we we go out this uh this spring and summer yeah make an effort to Give go try. further north and and find some better fishing all right, so thanks for joining me. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys had fun with the Easter egg hunt. I don't know how many there are, so I can't tell you how many to look for. And uh, so you'll have to, I, I probably will have, have to include that at the beginning. So if you missed the beginning, go back and watch the beginning for the Easter egg hunt and I'll talk about a little about what kind of prize I have to offer, if any at all. It might just be for fun. And I did haul those back five hours. <laughs> <laughs> for the Easter hike hunt, so not saying that you guys should appreciate it, but <laughs> I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> Good? Good. We're out? Yep. Thanks to Pelican for the sled. Helped us get in and out. Cheers, guys. You have to join us on this adventure when we catch rabbit, or hare, snowshoe hare, and Jeremy, you're on. Well, my Jeremy, fish is moving around too much. Jeremy, you're on.
And trout. And Ed. And Ed. And Look at those monster trout. Your head's not in the picture, Jeremy. We gotta redo Whoa, this. Oh, we got it. Alright, retake. <laughs>